Welcome to the Control Engineering Webcast, Effective Process Control Migration. I'm your moderator, Mark Hofke, and I'm happy to join you today on behalf of Control Engineering and CFE Media and Technology. CFE Media has met the standards and requirements of the Registered Continuing Education Program. Credit earned on completion of this program will re be reported to RCEP at rcep.net. A certificate of completion will be issued to each participant. As such, it does not include content that may be deemed or construed to be an approval or endorsement by RCEP. Many distributed control systems and supervisory control and data acquisition systems have reached the end of useful life. Sure, process control systems need to be secure, reliable, and safe, but what else do you need to know for an effective process control system migration? That's what we're getting here today. So the learning objectives for this course are to review who should be involved in a DCS migration and why, determine pre preparation, timing, and structure for a DCS migration, cover desirable traits and advantages of a modern process control system, learn what differs about migration projects compared to a few years ago, explore lessons learned before you start a DCS to PCS migration. To get the best results from the webcast platform, please make note of the following as you participate in today's event. If you're having technical problems, please click on the question mark at the top right corner of your screen to bring up a list of system checks to make before escalating to an online technician. If you're experiencing issues with slide or audio, please refresh your browser or click the refresh media button directly under the presenter's headshot. You can control the volume settings of the webcast by adjusting the volume on your computer or adjusting the volume on the webcast platform. If you need a technician, type a message into the Ask a Question box and someone will get to you as quickly as possible. Answers to your technical questions will be in the Answered Questions box on the left side of your screen. You can use the Ask a Question box on the left side of the screen to type questions for the speakers during the presentation for the Q&A session at the end. You may ask questions anytime during the presentation, and we'll get to as many as time allows. Questions for today's presenters will be answered verbally during the Q&A session at the end of the webcast. To download the presentation slides, use the Event Resources tab on the left side of the screen. To take the Learning Unit exam, use the Learning Unit exam tab option at the top of your screen. The exam will open in a new browser window. You can complete the exam after the webcast However, the link will break when the webcast signs off. The exam will be posted with the on-demand version of this webcast. The exam is for one RCEP ACEC Certified Professional Development Hour. The webcast is being recorded, including the Q&A session. We'll post an archive on the Control Engineering website in a few days, and we'll send you an email with the link to the archive once it's ready. The method of delivery and category uh, this event is a live educational webcast presented on March 24th, 2021. The educational category is Technical Health and Safety. We welcome to the webcast Don Bertusiak, President, Collaborative Systems Integration, and Lynn Nya, Business Development Manager, DCS Next Process Automation Consultant with Ma Maverick Technologies. I'm your moderator, Mark T. Hosky, Control Engineering Content Manager. Don Bartusiak is president of Collaborative Systems Integration and co-chair of the Open Process Automation Forum. In October 2020, he retired as chief engineer process control for ExxonMobil Research and Engineering with 33 years experience. Previously, he was a research engineer for Bethlehem Steel. At ExxonMobil, he implemented real-time artificial intelligence, linear and nonlinear model predictive control, and real-time optimization applications. Bartusiak held supervisory or senior technical positions responsible for instrumentation, process analyzers, control systems, and control applications. From 2000 to 2002, he was an adjunct professor at Rice University. Don uh, received a, a Bachelor of Science from University of Pennsylvania and a Master of Science and PhD degree from Lehigh University. He is co-inventor on five patents. Lin Ya is Business Development Manager, DCS Next Process Automation Consultant at Maverick Technologies. 
As a platform neutral process automation consultant and account manager, Lynn is a, has a genuine co customer advocate who has spent her career covering the design, implementation, estimation, and planning of industrial control projects and applications. With more than 30 years experience with instrumentation and control systems and software, Lynn leverages her industry expertise to help customers make strategic key technological business decisions and implement solutions that best fit their operational and business objectives for the future. Before Lynn starts her presentation, we're going to ask the audience to introduce themselves by answering a few poll questions. So the first audience poll question, which will go out now, uh, asks, what process-related opportunities are you missing by keeping a legacy distributed control system rather than upgrading? Check all that apply. So uh, difficulty applying incremental improvements, uh, modern alarm strategies, open uh, system standards-based architectures, real-time transparency into processes and supply chain, sleep because of after-hours maintenance and repairs, uptime or reliability because of unplanned shutdowns. So uh, please, um, Go ahead and answer that question. And in just a second, we'll move on to the second question. So we want to get your input and we'll give the results at the end of the webcast. All right, so moving on to the uh, second question. Uh, audience uh, poll, uh, what technology related opportunities are you missing? by keeping a legacy distributed control system rather than upgrading. Check all that to apply. Antiquated training and simulation, uh, high performance uh, human machine interface to attract younger engineers and get them up to speed faster uh, with a lower incident risk, inability to use mobility tools, lack of remote monitoring and controls, modern cybersecurity tools, related controls and instrumentation upgrades incompatible with legacy equipment. These are all important issues and uh, no doubt uh, part of the reason why you're here today. And so now we'll get to the, uh, the meat of our presentation. Uh, first uh, will be Lynn. Lynn, over to you. Thanks, Mark. First off, we're going to review who should be involved in a DCS migration and why? Next, we're going to determine the preparation, the timing, the structure for a DCS migration. After that, we'll cover the desirable traits and of a <laughs> desirable traits of and advantages of a modern process control system. So who should be involved? Let's begin with who should be involved with the DCS migration. Automation systems are critical to business operations. Everyone knows that. They are the brain for the plant, for process control and output, and ultimately the profitability. There's also a lot at stake, hence stakeholder. By definition, a stakeholder is a person with an interest or a concern in the business. So who needs to be there and why? Let's start at the corporate level. Depending on the size of the migration, any number of corporate level resources may be involved. Some examples are a capital planning manager, a procurement manager, a program or project manager. It could be anyone at the corporate level. These resources usually, not always, but usually, have great influence over the amount of funds to be used and when they can be distributed. An example is a large year-over-year -year migration that may cost upwards of anywhere from two to $10 million. To manage business effectively, a maximum year-over-year -year spend will be set for the duration of the migration, be it two years or 10 years. They will determine the dollars every year that can be expended on that migration. Of course, the bigger the migration, 
the longer it may take and the more money to spend. The following, so let's move on to the site level. Let's move on down. The following representative resources should always be involved in the very beginning. Engineering, operations, and maintenance. Never underestimate the necessity to have as much positive support from each of these disciplines. Each discipline is critical to the implementation and ongoing su support and sustainability of the new control system. Here's just an example. Let's say that engineering and operations disagree on how a unit should run to obtain its full output potential. Engineering insists running everything in automatic is the best way, but they've never really fully explained why or gotten operations input or involved, so operations is not heard. So they don't have buy-in or agreement. Operations truly believes their solution is better. Until there is agreement between those two entities, there's friction. And the last thing you want on a migration is friction. You never want to slow things down. You want everyone in agreement and lockstep moving forward to a common goal. Another reason to have involvement from each of these disciplines is that long after the migration project is complete, the site will have total ownership of the control system and will be required to maintain it. Getting them involved upfront will bring great benefits of support, tribal knowledge, and personal satisfaction of each of the discipline's resources by being a part of something that will likely be there longer than their careers at that particular site. I know that in my career, there have been times that we started a migration and people on the team said, hey, I remember when I installed that way back in the day. And they can tell me particulars about what happened uh, what was good, what was bad, who worked on the project, and what it was like. So it's really a memorable thing when you do a migration. So let's move on to how to prepare for a DCS migration. Historically, front-end loading or FEL process begins the project and has three primary goals. Number one is providing budgeting justification to successfully navigate the corporate CapEx funding, bold, hmm, funding toll gates and the ability to secure stakeholder, remember the stakeholders, support through the organization. Number two is to reduce the implementation risk for cost, schedule, and system performance. Number three is to provide reliable reliable is very key there, preliminary engineering and project execution planning. So what are FEL phases? So just briefly, FEL1 is a conceptual level. Its accuracy is approximately plus or minus 50% for the estimate and subsequent uh, documents that go with it. And it's basically a, a go or no go for the project. So it's very high level conceptual. The business wants to know, does it even make sense to do this project? For most DCS migrations today, they're facing obsolescence or there's risk issues. So sometimes they'll just skip the FEL1 phase altogether because they already know they have to do it. They don't have a choice. FEL2 level is the capital planning level. That's uh, a accuracy of about plus or minus 30%. This is when the year over year plan is estimated. And also during this phase is the appropriate time if you think, if a company thinks they may want to migrate to a different control system platform, this is the phase that they would select that platform at. FEL3 is to fund individual projects. There may be many 
smaller projects in a large capital plan. So every project gets an FEL3 because it needs to be narrowed to plus or minus 10%. But let's not get hung up on FEL. That could be a whole webcast all by itself. Let's just say for the purposes of this webcast, let's assume right now that we're in the FEL2 phase and we're looking at capital planning at a plus or minus 30% accuracy for estimating and planning for year-over-year -year migration. So how do we begin to do all that? First, we begin by defining an overall scope that's well aligned with the business needs and the facility requirements. Depending on the size of the migration, the scope may need to be parsed out into multiple projects. Remember when I said FEL3 gets, um, every all the individual projects get an FEL3? This is that parsing out. It could be a really big organization or a plant that has a lot of different processes or separate processes that need to be migrated separately. So there might be separate projects, or this might be a smaller migration. It could be something very much smaller. Next, very early in the process, you'll want to define the risks and determine how to mitigate them. This is a critical activity that should get input from the stakeholders at the corporate level and should also have a brainstorming session at the site level with operations, maintenance, and engineering. There's those three, again, that I mentioned to you that it are really important to keep them working together, even through looking at all the risks. Getting those risks on paper and understanding what they are and how to mitigate them before you ever begin will be extraordinarily helpful in your migration. You'll want to consider such things as safety, downtime, resource availability, network traffic levels, data integrity, cybersecurity, while there's still the greatest flexibility to deal with them. It's, it's much easier to deal with all those things before you started your project than when you're halfway into it. It's best that this step be executed prior to developing the migration plan. Again, the earlier that's identified, the easier it is to deal with, and it's also uh, less expensive to deal with it from the get-go. The FEL2 phase, as I mentioned before, is the appropriate time to evaluate and select the best control system platform to be migrated to and evaluate your project options. Look at all the options and really take your time to see what is going to be the best fit. Subsequently, development of an execution plan for both the engineering and the installation of the new system should begin. That includes the reverse engineering of the functionality of the legacy system to ensure the functionality, no functionality is left behind, as well as how the new system will be cut over. Will it be hot or will it be in an outage? From the previous steps, the development of an accurate cost estimate to the level appropriate for the FEO phase for the project that the project is in should be started. This is called the total installed cost estimate. And if you ever work on a front end loading project, you will hear that a lot, total installed cost estimate or TIC. So one of the outputs of that TIC or estimate is the man hours. This information is going to be critical to the development of the migration schedule. A proper migration schedule should be all inclusive of all of the following for each parsed out project. So it should include the current and subsequent FELs, design, engineering, testing, installation, startup, and commissioning. Additionally, development of the total cost of ownership, or TCO, for comparisons of different options to select the best alternatives and to maximize return on investment should be considered. 
if the migration is small, the cost of putting a TCO or total cost of ownership together may not make sense. Utilizing all of the documents I've mentioned, an assessment should be you using, I'm sorry, an assessment using a phased approach to spread out the capital expenditure over the years should be analyzed and reviewed with the guidance of corporate stakeholders for expenditures. So let's look at how we successfully plan a migration. If you take nothing else away from this discussion, I'd like to emphasize that an early and strong effort spent on good, effective planning pays dividends. You may be able to change the outcome of your migration project throughout the effort, even towards the end. However, we all know that the effort required to affect that change and the associated cost rises very quickly the further we get into the project. Don't undercut the future success of your project by skimping on the planning and budgeting effort during early definition. Effort spent early pays for itself many times over later. So let's look at the chart. If you look at the chart towards the left-hand side, you'll see that the ability to influence the outcome is the greatest at the far left in the planning FEL 1, 2, and 3, whereas the cost is at its lowest at that point. As you move across the chevron horizontally and you start moving into design and development, you'll notice that your ability to influence the outcome goes down significantly and the cost goes up significantly. So I want you to just think about being towards the end of the design and development section of your or phase of your project and some sort of a change or there's a discovery that you don't, you need some networking equipment or you start changing tags or anything like that, that's going to cause reverse engineering. And anytime you have additional reverse engineering, it's going to cost more money. And this is usually how budgets get blown on projects, is by not spending enough upfront time planning, getting everybody on board, and really thinking through everything and thinking far ahead and not just trying to go ahead and get it migrated. I've had a lot of customers that are in a really big hurry to get their migration done and it takes us twice as long to get it done because they skipped the whole planning, the real planning phase and went straight into implementation. Uh, it's a, it's a, it, unfortunately it's a, it's a common issue. Okay, so let's move on to and talk about some innovation. Whenever I talk about opportunities, I really, really want to emphasize that these are the items you should incorporate into your migration planning because they will pay for themselves. I've seen it time and time again. For example, tests have shown that it takes 41% longer for an operator to handle an abnormal situation using a legacy DCS interface as compared to a high-performance HMI in a modern DCS. With a high-performance HMI, plant problems are recognized much earlier, giving operators a chance to intervene before production is impacted. And I can give you a real live, real world instance that I witnessed myself. I was um, consulting and in a control room with my customer and they had an incident and they were using the black screens with uh, a lot of different colors. You've seen them that's on a lot of 
probably like the Honeywell old TDC 3000s. And it took them more than 20 minutes to figure out what had gone wrong. There was a big, all production stopped. My customer excused himself from me. I just stood back and watched what was kind of happening in the control room. And there was a lot of confusion. There was some finger pointing. There were operators running in and out of the doors, trying to figure out what was going on. And it took them 20 minutes to figure out what had happened so that they could begin to fix it and get back online. That's a really long time. Okay, so moving on. Likewise, a typical plant loses more than 5% of its total capacity every year to dis due to disruptions caused by poor alarm response. By eliminating unnecessary alarms and properly prioritizing those that remain, it's much easier for operators to quickly identify root causes and effectively take action. So what I've talked about there are two separate innovations. One being the HMI, high performance graphics, and the second being alarm rationalization by reducing the number of alarms coming into the control room. Both of those were part of the real world instance I just gave you. And I think for a lot of facilities, that is the case if they have are not already migrated to a new system. And even if, even if they have moved, migrated to a new system, they may not have performed those activities when they did migrate. So it's not too late to go back and get that done. And it will still pay for itself. But it's always better to look at that during your migration. You have an opportunity to really take advantage of what's going of, of that time and that planning to gracefully get things incorporated into your migration. So identifying what new technologies to incorporate based on their benefit for your particular situation will pay dividends. Establishing integration across multiple platforms, including manufacturing execution systems or MES and business systems have become crucial to being competitive. Incorporating the latest control functionality, developing effective HMIs, alarm management, compliant safety systems, the latest cybersecurity defenses, and other valuable technology will enhance profitability. And cybersecurity these days, I think everyone knows, is really very, very important. Um, there, if you stop and think about the implications and the risk of not having proper cybersecurity in place for your control system, it's, it's extensive to say the very least. So let's just for a moment imagine if the profitable output were increased by only 1% per day. After your migration, you've increased output by 1% per day. That could be substantial depending on the business that the migration is occurring in. So just let that sink in 1% of profits from, uh, from your business. That's a lot. That's really a lot. So let's, let's summarize just a little bit. Let's talk about the lessons that we've just learned. The, we've looked at and the all and involved all the right resources in both the corporate and the site level. Through planning and risk mitigation, early miss, risk mitigation early is key to the success of the migration. Also, leveraging innovative technologies to increase business output and stay ahead of your competition is also crucial. So while we're in this phase of talking about innovation and all the advantages of a new control system, I'm going to pass it off to Don. 
So here you go, Don. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, hey, folks, uh, so Lynn just gave us uh, an excellent exposition of uh, DCS migration projects, particularly from the perspective of the, the project management aspects. And we're really spot on. I'm going to pick up on some of Lynn's points uh, somewhat quantitatively. Uh, but with, with my contribution to this webinar, uh, I'm going to take more of the engineering and operations perspective and uh, I'm really going to speak uh, kind of to some extent from a, from a trend in the trenches view on, on what happens during DCS migrations. OK, so that's that's going to be the, the contrast that you'll see in my perspective compared to Lynn's. But Lynn's, Lynn's remarks were, were excellent, spot on. Um, so my outline is on the screen here. Let me summarize it. I will basically make some remarks about um, current state of the art of DCS systems and what we see as the art of the possible in, in, a, in a future state. And, and, and it's all about talking about DCS migration activities. So, so th think of my remarks from, from those two perspectives. What, what do we have now? What's the state of the art now? What do migrations look like now? What, are, what is motivating us to do better than what we can do now? Okay, so that's really where I'm going to be coming from. <clears throat> um, so uh, I, I wanna offer a thesis statement uh, for my talk here. And let me just assert that uh, DCS migrations are typically uh, acts of necessity motivated by obsolescence. DCS in today's state, DCS migrations are acts of necessity motivated by obsolescence. Um, we always try to justify these projects with a return angle. It's often tough to do that when, um, when when you're doing an in-kind replacement. So, so that let me talk about the scenarios um, that are involved in DCS migration projects. So when I use the phrase in-kind replacement, that basically means you're taking currently available state of the art. You're either sticking with your same supplier and upgrading to a new version of that supplier's product or in some cases, you're gonna switch from one supplier to another. The typical phrase that's used for that scenario is competitive replacement. And so what your company does, uh, either to continue with your current supplier or switch to another, reflects your company procurement strategy. And it, it's out of the scope of my remarks today to, to talk about you know, whether you have preferences for you know, you, whether you have a supplier preferred short list, whether you prefer to competitively bid, or like in, in the bookend case, whether you single source. There are pros and cons of those procurement strategies, but it's beyond the scope of what I wanna talk about today. But what you do here affects the, the tactics of any, of any DCS migration. So I'll talk about the implications of those choices that you make later in my talk. Um, if, you, if you think about the, the principles that you learn from reliability engineering, right, the basic choice that you have to make is do I replace in kind or do I go after an improvement? So really the latter portions of my talk today are what, what I am working on and, and my colleagues are working on and what we see in the future um, as the opportunity to bring some real improvements um, to this, to what we're doing with DCS migrations. And, and I'll just drop the, the, the hint right now, we're gonna be talking about open architectures. Um, so so that's, that's the overview of my talk here in detail. Now, now Lynn already mentioned the differences between the types of migrations that you do an on process or hot cutover or a cutover done during a shutdown, AKA cold cutover. Let me make some brief comments there. Um, I, I think the most common approach, if, it, dep it depends on your industry. If, if your manufacturing unit 
uh, for whatever reasons, is shut down from time to time, then you have an opportunity to do a cold cutover. Um, if you are in a, a manufacturing operation, a, a continuous operation that you know, will go years without a shutdown, without a planned shutdown, the, the likelihood is that you will adopt for a hot cutover strategy. And there, there are limit, I'm not going to, my talk is really going to be on the basis of hot cutovers, but I, I do want to make a comment or two about cold cutovers. Um, you know, some, some companies, and I, the, the, the notable example would, is the Japanese companies that have to go down like for routine safety inspections every year. That's where I've seen cold cutovers being done um, in units like refineries and, and the big petrochemical plants. The, the typical argument is that with, with a hot cutover scenario, you're, you're taking risk in smaller pieces, right? You may botch a loop transfer, or you may get a new control strategy wrong, but that's a very small risk compared to the risk of having to extend your downtime or risking a big unplanned production loss because of delays in startups after a massive replacement project during a turnaround. So that's usually the basic thinking behind this cold or hot cutover scenario decision. But again, I'm going to I'm going to leave that topic. I don't have time to elaborate more. Let me press ahead. So just to just to tee up my remarks, let me make some baseline comments about the the, the traits of currently available industrial control systems. So on you know on, the good news is that you know we and we enjoy. Uh, our suppliers give us systems that have been honed over decades, um, and and they they are reliable. They deliver high availability to 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 their customers, and, and that's wonderful. Um, today's DCSs are are very tightly integrated, and one of the benefits of that very tight integration is relative ease of use of the system. I mean, uh, your your engineers can. They build a tag, whether they want to use that tag in a control strategy or put those data up on the HMI or historize those data. It's relatively easy to do. Benefits of tight integration. So what are some of the negatives associated with the DCSs that we have today? Um, be because they, they're made up uh, many times of proprietary interfaces and communications mechanisms, there's limited interoperability between systems sourced from different suppliers. This is an impediment to business value capture by the end users. Um, there are barriers to entry uh, for innovations coming from third party suppliers, be it hardware or software, where you'd like to in implement those solutions within the boundary of the, of the DCS. And, and there's a downside of tight integration. Um, when a component piece becomes obsolete, uh, the, the downside of the tight integration often means you have to replace the whole system just when one component become, becomes obsolete. Or in the case of computing nodes, you're, you're giving up the ability to take advantage of Moore's law because you simply can't insert new computing technology easily um, inside the boundaries of the DCS without the supplier doing it for you. And the other unintended consequence of that tight integration, because these uh, platforms are different among the suppliers, is even if you upgrade within one supplier's generations of products, you may actually, the end user may have to rewrite your control strategies, reprogram, reconfigure, rewrite, simply because the proprietary language uh, has changed. Uh, between suppliers or even from one supplier's generations of products to another. Um, and, a th and another attribute uh, of the current, current state of the art is that largely the systems that are currently available were designed quite some time ago before cybersecurity is, was the threat that it is today. So a gap to be closed is to improve the, our ability to introduce cybersecurity technologies in the industrial control system. So let's let's get into the details now of, of, of a life a life uh, of a DCS migration project. And again, not so. Lynn gave a fabulous exposition from the project management perspective. I'm going to give you the in the trenches perspective. 
So I won't reiterate the, the exposition that Lynn gave in terms of justifying the projects, selecting the target system. Um, so let me pick up the story here with this, this third, the third bullet, the third sub bullet on this slide. Um, particularly if you're in a hot cutover scenario where your old system and new system are going to coexist for an extended period of time, uh, one of the things that uh, can be done is to introduce a temporary migration gateway device that enables the old and the new system to uh, interoperate for a period of time so that you can progressively move uh, your controls from the old system to the new system. There's a lot of devil in the details there uh, about what goes into these proprietary, uh, uh, rather these these uh, temporary uh, migration gateway types of devices in terms of needs for cooperation of the intellectual property owner, et cetera. But again, I don't, I don't have time to go into the details on that. Um, then you have to design the applications in the target system. And a comment that I want to make there is, you know, if you bring project management talent into your project here, you have to assume that their frame of reference is going to be, you know, minimize change, minimize change, minimize change, control change. So you might get into a venture philosophy that says, the new, the new applications are going to look exactly the same as the old applications. Well, the downside of that is you can forego a lot of value to do the job better, faster, or cheaper by taking advantage of the capabilities of the target system. And I've, I've, I've actually seen projects, head-to-head, apples-to-apples comparisons of projects that have taken what I call a transliterate approach. That's where the venture philosophy is that the new application should be exactly the same as the old versus a translate approach, which takes advantage of the capabilities of the new system. I'm probably signaling my bias here, but again, this is a trap you need to watch out for, um, depending upon the staffing and resources you bring to your team. Um, you need to design your HMI graphics in the target system. I, I'm guessing everybody in, in this audience knows what, what I'm talking about there. Um, so I'm not going to elaborate on this, but you know the you know the the operators have a lot of ownership on on the schematics, so it's important to to get them involved as you uh, you know as you propose new uh, new schematics. You know, Lynn already talked about the advantages of improved HMIs. You know, the other thing about the HMI is. Um, it tends to be the thing that your management sees. You know, your management might not always understand all the, the arcane details that the we control folk do, but the one thing that they'll get a quick reaction on is the graphics. So, you know, it, it's important. Um, is it is it really fundamentally important? Like the math that goes, the math and the computer science and the, all the wizardry that goes into what we do. I don't know, taking a purist perspective, maybe it's not so important, but it's certainly a visible aspect of your system. And, and again, the operators take a, a, you know, great ownership of this. So it's an, it's an important matter. Um, design the logistics for operator console migration. This is probably less of an a, a, of a, of a important point now, but you know, back in the old days, when the operator console was a, a masterworks of stainless steel fabrication, you know, this could be a really, really big deal. Um, so I, I won't elaborate more. You know, the new style, the, the, the operator consoles tend to be almost uh, self-contained. You know, they're sit down, stand up things now. Uh, they got sound, they got sound curtains, you know, all sorts of fancy stuff now compared to the old days. Uh, the devil in the details now, the big, the big ticket stuff, if you have to replace your I.O., is designing the logistics for your I.O. I.O. cutover. This is perhaps the most difficult and most uh, costly part of a, of a migration project, if you have to replace your I.O. And a lot of times the constraint here is the availability of space in your equipment room. So I've been on projects where we've had to build new equipment rooms just to enable the, the cutover. Um, but if you're lucky, if you're lucky, there's enough space in your equipment room that you can establish an initial footprint for your new I.O. 
And as you, as, since the IO density has gotten higher over the years, you can claim, you can gain real estate as you cut over by uh, progressive demolition of the uh, old IO kit as you install the new. But this can be some of the most costly stuff in your project if you have to deal with this. And then Lynn, Lynn already mentioned uh, very, very well about the need to develop a resource plan for migration execution. So you're going to have instrumentation teams, uh, systems teams that are doing the computer work. Your applications engineers are probably doing most of the work. Good, good chance you're going to have to double man your operator consoles uh, during the periods of these hot, uh, hot cutovers. Then you get into execution. Um, so I guess this having that discussion of the planning exercise, this should be pretty pretty quick to get through this. You know, you install your new operator consoles or or, uh, or stations, and then the the day to day work, building new tags, building applications, new HMI graphics in in the target system, and then on a loop by loop basis in a hot cutover scenario, you're transferring I/O from the old to the new system uh, and connecting, you know, connecting the, the new, the IO to the tags and applications that you've built in the target system, uh, commissioning those new applications frequently, you have to tune them, vetting them to make sure that they work properly. And then the last activity that, that I left out of this version of the slide is to decommission your old system. So that's a, that's a, I want to say a day in the life, but um, it, it's more than a day. Uh, some of these, depending upon the size of your system, these hot cutovers can take years. So uh, with this chart, I wanted to talk semi-quantitatively about the effort that goes into the, a hot cutover. So with this chart here, I, I gave a, this is a semi-quantitative breakdown of the cost distribution. This is accurate, but not precise, right? So in the neighborhood of 20% of your cost is going to be for new hardware and software licenses. Um, about 40% is going to be for the engineering and construction services. And about 40% is going to be for your project management. And depending upon your company's uh, policies and practices, I mean, this line between what you call project management or what you call engineering can shift. But the, the basic takeaway from, from this is that the majority of your costs are going to be in the, in the work hours of the operating company or your contractors to do this work. So these data uh, are, are my personal experience from uh, you know, many uh, hot cutover projects, scaling, ranging in size from 1,000 to 10,000 IO, where... Uh, again, for, for this size project, if you start the clock at the planning project justification stage through decommissioning, you're talking two to four or so years durations. Um, the magnitude of cost in very coarse numbers is a million to tens of millions of dollars. Um, as I said, when detailing the pie chart, the hardware and software costs are only a minor portion. Your instrumentation systems and applications engineering costs are a function of the I.O. count and the amount of application rewriting that you have to do. And your project management costs are largely a function of the duration of the project. So I want to I want to pick our heads up now and maybe look to the future and. Um, so I'm, I'm really segueing quickly here, and I, and I don't have time to go into a lot of the details, but um, I want to touch back on that. If it's not an in-kind replacement and you go after an improved initiative, what, what magnitude would you be looking for? for uh, is it, are you looking for an incremental change? Or are you looking for a step change? And the story I'd like to tell you all now is really where we're seeking a step change improvement in, in what can be done in a VCS migration scenario. So this chart here is, uh, okay, so I'm going, now I'm going to be talking about open process automation. Mark, Mark encouraged me to talk about this uh, in this webinar, so I'm gonna take this opportunity to do so. Um, but open process automation is an initiative that's been underway now for a, a good four years, if, if not longer, depending upon where you start the clock. 
to bring open architecture principles to the industrial control uh, marketplace. Uh, in contrast to the Purdue model that we use that reflects the, the reference architecture or, or design principles of today's DCSs, this chart depicts the reference architecture of open process automation. And I'll, I'll be very, very brief about technical stuff here. So there's three basic elements to distinguish what we're working on here compared to a traditional DCS. So characteristic number one are the edge devices, which are called distributed control nodes or DCNs. Um, so this is where you do IO. This is where you do your first touch of computing. So to map it to the Purdue model, this is these devices is where you will be doing like Purdue model level one and level two types of applications. Uh, at, uh, aspect number two is the OPAS connectivity framework, where in contrast to the currently available products in industry standard networking technology is being used here for communications among nodes and with other, uh, other parts of your enterprise. And then the third as aspect of, of the open process automation reference architecture is the concept of the advanced compute platform. Think of this as your platform for Purdue model level two and three types of applications where we're basically in, in, in essence, trying to use the types of innovations that have been developed in IT data center technology, scale this down to the uh, low latency, high availability requirements of a control system for on-premise location. Okay, so that's that's all I have time to talk about for, for what the open process automation architecture is. But let me shift to a discussion of what are the pain points that we are, would be solving with this and the, and the incentives for new business value generation. So uh, for value generation, uh, you will have the ability with, uh, by adopting, if we can uh, all evolve to this uh, architecture, to introduce uh, innovations in software or hardware technology much more rapidly than we can do simply because the interfaces to these systems will be defined in an industry standard manner, thereby enabling us to introduce new value adding technology much more rapidly than we can today. Uh, how would we reduce total cost of ownership? Um, in this state, we will be able much more readily to do upgrades at the or replacements at the component level rather than the whole system level. This will radically change the game in terms of how migrations and upgrades get done. Um, and again, I don't have much time to go into the details. I'll just leave that one nugget. And the third mechanism of value and the incentive to go after to pursue this is that um, we are basically building in um, mechanisms for adaptable cybersecurity means to be added and incorporated into the component products that would make up an OPA, OP, OPA standard based system. So in the interest of time, let me kind of get to my last slide um, and just, just some concluding remarks. So I, I, tried to, I tried to share some details, including some quantitative information on DCS migration projects but I want you to take away um, the notion that I'm, I'm, we're not bashing the, the, the suppliers in this space. I mean, control systems have gotten incrementally better since the 1980s, but the, the, the step change in innovation that marked the transition from single loop, single loop electronic to DCSs, so I'm going back into the 70s and 80s, that was a big step change. But since then, it's been kind of incremental progress. And the story that Lynn and I are telling you about DCS migrations really hasn't changed much in a really material way over the last three, three to four decades. So, and, and like where the operating companies have generated the most new value has really come from the applications that have been delivered in Purdue model level three, really above the control system itself. So that's the kind of macro context that I'm coming from. 
And, and if you compare that uh, to the rate of value creation and cost reduction that has been experienced by the tech industry and what you experience as a con consumer user of electronics, the contrast is quite stark. And so I, I, I put this is this is meant to be a little bit of coy thing here uh, to, to, to engage the audience a little bit. So blank, <laughs> blank, a word is defined by doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. If we really want to change the game in terms of what happens during control system upgrades, I think the time has come for us to step back and take a different approach. So the audience can fill in the blanks here. And the, the thing I want to leave this uh, audience with is the, this, the thing I talked about open process automation is not just slideware. Um, there's a many, many people, many, many companies have been working on the open process automation standard now for a good four years. We have a lot to, to tell about it. Uh, this is coming. It's not going away. And the, the real question now is, you know, when will the operating companies start uh, writing bid specs to uh, and, and to use the operate the OPA types of technologies? And with that, I'll close. Thank you, Mark. Thanks so much, Don. I appreciate it. Uh, Lynn, thank you for your presentation as well. But we'll quickly, um, I'll just mention the top responses on the poll questions. So recall the first one was, uh, what process-related opportunities are you missing by keeping a legacy DCS rather than upgrading? The top responses were uptime or reliability because of unplanned shutdowns. Uh, difficulty applying incremental improvements and uh, open system standards based architecture. So that should be gratifying for, for Don. Uh, the poll question two was to what technology related opportunities are you missing? And the top three responses there were uh, related controls and instrumentation upgrades that are incompatible with legacy equipment. Uh, and then uh, modern cybersecurity tools, and lack of remote monitoring and controls. And so thank you very much for audience uh, participation there. We will get on to a few questions. Uh, before we close, please submit your questions, and any we don't have time for, we'll get to offline. Within a few days, the presentation will be available for on-demand viewing, along with a link to the quiz for potential PDH credit. We'll post the archive to the uh, control engineering website and send you an email with uh, a link di uh, directly to it when that and related resources are ready. On to the questions. Uh, how do you integrate new process control systems with existing uh, DCS or SCADA systems? Don, uh, Lynn, either one oh. of you would like to take that? Go ahead, ladies first. <laughs> um, so I think that planning is is probably your your best por course of action. Having a a SCADA system and mapping it over to a control system it takes some time and it takes some uh, some documentation. I know that uh, most of the projects that I've seen come through uh, that I've done lack documentation. So mapping things out and planning things out uh, is usually the best course of action. Don, would yeah, you answer answer, that? Yeah, yeah, quick answer for me. So if it's a, if what you're trying to interface to is a, like a package mounted unit or you know a modular unit or an analyzer or something like that, then the, the, the workhorse for that continues to be Modbus. Um, if you're trying to interface to a, a, a legacy, a, a larger thing, um, that's when those gateway products come to bear. And um, you know, the only way that the gateway works is that is the supplier of the existing. If the supplier of the existing thing that you're trying to interface to, not the new target system, really has to let you know what the data structures and the protocols are to build that gateway. So that's. You know that there's a technical and commercial aspect to whether that can even be done or not. So that they're the kind of the hard nuggets of interfacing with with systems that are not built to industry standards. Great. Um, how do you integrate uh, different control systems of uh, 
different brands from different vendors. That must be a, an issue for many companies. Um, well, I think that uh, I've worked in many facilities that have uh, a hodgepodge over time where the plant has grown uh, by one separate unit at a time where they have uh, maybe a Micon PLC and Allen Bradley PLC, and then someone decided to put in a DCS and something else. But they certainly can be all migrated and integrated into a common uh, DCS if you want, or they can be, uh, the data can be brought up into a single operator interface where it looks a bit more seamlessly if, if, if that's what they choose to do. Um, there are many ways to, to approach such a thing. I'll pass that off to Don as well. Well, I'll give you a short and provocative answer, Mark. They can't. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm sure there's a, a lot of uh, data consternation when people do try right. to uh, make make it all work together. So yeah. um, at, at this point, um, I, I would thank the audience uh, for their great questions. We will get to as many of the unanswered questions offline as we can. And thanks again so much for our presenters and their expertise. Don Bertuziak, President of Collaborative Systems Integration, and Lynn Niao, a Business Development Manager, DCS Next Process Automation Consultant with Maverick Technologies. Uh, now that we're just about done, uh, we do want to hear your feedback. A short survey will pop up on the screen as soon as the webcast ends. Please take a moment to complete it. We will use this information to improve our webcasts. Finally, on behalf of Control Engineering and CFE Media and Technology, thanks so much for attending. This concludes our webcast. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>